I was interested in your comments about using Facebook and Twitter and things like that to look for indicators of safety and efficacy. Has there been any attempt to engage patients more directly, like say yeah. an app on your phone, so once you become a yeah. someone who takes a drug, you can be prompted or you can ask questions about, or raise concerns you have about it or respond to questions that are sent from the drug producer to say, have you found this effective? Have you been taking it reliably? Uh, so there are things like that being done. There is, there is a problem, which is um, if you're not careful, that strays into promotion in a way that you're not allowed to promote. So it, 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 it's, a, it's a boundary between what you can do in terms of asking questions repeatedly and going back to people um, versus really trying to collect information. But there definitely are things that are doing that. And there's a very interesting approach, actually, which um, I'm particularly keen on at the moment, on even before you start a clinical trial, crowdsourcing what patients really care about. So when you look at most clinical trials, and I illustrated it a bit with a six-minute walk, but you find out that the things that are measured are things that either regulators think are important or we think are important or doctors think are important. They aren't necessarily the things that patients think are important. So there are a couple of companies, one I know called Transparency Inc., that is doing crowdsourcing before you start a clinical trial of what the patients think, and they're redesigning the outcomes of clinical trials on the back of that. And the FDA who aren't, so this is the US regulators, who aren't notorious for sort of being flexible, when presented with this data, said, well, how can I not accept that that's important? Because you just told me 3,000 patients tell you it is important. So I think there's a lot that can be done there. And there's a lot also uh, to start thinking about how you can be much smarter about collecting information, including in the way that you talked about. But there are some, there are some things to watch out for in that. And let's go for the lady um, just along. Thank you, that was fascinating. I'm just wondering if this kind of um, big data sharing can be useful in identifying um, unexpected uses of drugs, yeah. and particularly for pediatrics, where yeah. um, often there isn't the data um, on children, but maybe this would be better. And I'm very conscious that a particular area that's difficult is when young people are having their growth spurt, spurt and then all the biochemistry goes haywire. And I just yeah. wonder if, if um, this drug efficacy can be um, pinpointed more easily from this vast amount of data. Um, it's a great question. Um, I think in terms of the starting point is do I think that when you start doing social listening and so on you'll pick up new uses for drugs I think the answer is yes and, and we know historically that those uses do emerge because a doctor starts trying it for something they find out something and then you, you find out some data so I think on that side yes I think the much more tricky question is the one about children and adolescents and I don't think you'll ever find that out from here because most of those drugs aren't going to be used in children and adolescents unless it's in the indication because quite rightly you know, doctors who are at liberty to prescribe off-label off don't in children and, and, and um, adolescents, or at least they do in a very restricted way. So I, I'm not sure how much will come from that. But I think the, the, the point about by much more intensive monitoring, could you find out something? And then in a clinical trial, to the question earlier, could you, by getting a free text response from adolescents, find out much more? I really believe you could. So I, I think that in a clinical trial, we have a tendency to ask questions. Did you do that? Did you do that? I'm going to measure this. I'm going to measure that. I think we should be much more open to just saying, you tell me whatever you want to tell me, and we'll analyse it and try and find out if they're trends. And I think adolescents would be a great place if you're doing an adolescence trial to try and do that. Now, there is a problem, which is, you know, somebody, and this is a really big issue that needs to be resolved in a, at a sort of societal level, which is, at the moment, if we have a side effect, we're duty-bound to report it into the regulators. So in that model, if an adolescent at 1 o'clock in the morning types, I'm going to kill myself, what are the obligations that a drug company has to do something about that in terms of reporting it? And I think you know, it, it's, these, are, these are not easy things to resolve. But I don't believe that problem should stop us doing that type of thing because I think the truth is that person was thinking that anyway whether you picked it up or not. Okay. 
There's a, a lady just on this side. No, it's a man. Sorry, no, it's a lady. <laughs> this lady here. It's very difficult black. to see who's Sorry, who, actually. It's the lights, I can't. I was very interested in the idea of collaborating um, with other uh, drug companies, but also when you put the different malaria uh, molecules out there, um, were you just giving them away? Or what if one of right. another company had picked one of those up and that had been the miracle cure? Would you have some kind of um, cruel or back on that? <laughs> no. So, so um, what, first of all, of course, as I said, those are start, it's highly unlikely that any one of those 13,500 compounds is the drug. They're more likely to be a starting point from which you need to design your drug. So that is a very unlikely scenario where somebody would just say, I've found the, found the drug, I'm off. We put no uh, uh, restrictions on it other than we said, if you use this, you must put your data in the public domain. So you can't use this and then be totally secretive with your data, you should put it in the public domain. Some of the compounds had patents on them. Most of them didn't because they're just starting points. Those that did, we put into a patent pool and said, as long as you're using this to try and treat malaria, you can get free access to the patent um, and nobody's going to make a fortune from treating malaria. So um, there was no restrictions on how people could, could use this. But it's something you could do for other drugs uh, or other areas if you wanted to. Well, it is something you could do, um, and clearly there are other areas like malaria where you could do it. So we're doing it at the moment in tuberculosis, tuberculosis and leishmaniasis, which are similar diseases. It's a very difficult business model to think you could do it for your mainstream business unless you can think of what it is that you do own in that system. And that's really why I think if this experiment turns out to be successful, that is a fundamental question to try and address. How do you build the right business model around that? Okay, do we have a question on this side? No. So why, why don't we come to... And there are questions in the middle as well, I think. Uh, and this gentleman here, and then we can go to you if you put your hand up. Just to uh, continue that theme, um, antibiotics have been a cornerstone of modern medicine, and we appear to be threatened by growing um, resistance. The business models that have grown with the farmer don't seem to be appropriate. What ways can we build a better private public approach to solving this problem? Well, I, I think the, the problem with um, lack of antibiotics and the growth of resistance it has got multiple um, parts to it. So, you know, why are we getting multiple resistance? I think there's definitely an issue of overprescription and overuse which needs to be tackled. Why isn't it easy to make new antibiotics? And I think um, there's a belief that somehow everyone's being lazy about it. And I have to say, I came, when I left academia and went into industry, I did think it would probably be a good area to be in because it ought to be easier. Of course, it's not easier, as you know, actually. I mean, it's not easier because the bugs you're trying to treat exist in hostile chemical environments. They have adapted to throw chemicals out. The moment you give them a chemical, they kick it right back out again. So if you look at most of the doses you need to give for an antibiotic, they are 500 milligrams or a gram, two grams, huge, huge drug doses. Once you get up to giving somebody a gram of drug substance, the chances of you having a toxic effect on the human body are very, very high. So it's a very difficult problem to work out how to get the chemistry right to get a new antibiotic. People have tried you know, natural products, they try uh, ways to block chemicals being kicked out, but it's a tough problem. So the first thing is there's a, there's a massive scientific problem in making new antibiotics. Um, there's then a problem of how you actually do clinical trials because um, most of the resistance is occurring in places um, where most clinical trials aren't done. So you have huge, huge resistance problems in India. The FDA want the trials to be done in the US where the resistance isn't there yet. So you have a logistics problem of how you do the clinical trial. Um, and you have a regulatory series of barriers which actually make it quite difficult. So all of those things need to be tackled. And then at the end of this, and this is the economic point you raise, imagine this. It takes you a billion dollars to make your antibiotic. When you've made your antibiotic, the right answer for society is not to use it. Put it on the shelf, wait until you've got a problem that only that antibiotic can tackle, and then use it. 
There are it's a very, very limited number of times that a head of R&D can go to the board and say, I want to make a medicine that no one's going to use. <laughs> and so there really is an economic... And, and it's, it, so that's a big... And people are looking at it. Should there be pre-purchase agreements? Should it be more like vaccines? How can you do it? You do need to tackle that economic barrier as well. One last question um, from oh, in the middle. Yes. Okay, no, thanks for the talk, Patrick. Um, just could you, could you address uh, regulators and their ability to handle some of this new data? So regulators are generally set up to address randomised controlled trials. Yep. Uh, you're talking about continuous data monitoring, which needs different types of statistics. Um, and real-world trials like Solfa was a fantastic yep. trial, but... What's the ability of regulators to deal with it? And do you think they're going to be able to keep up with what the industry can throw at them? Um, well, I think they're thinking about it very hard. I know, because I'm involved in discussions that are taking place that started very actively with the last FDA commissioner, Rob Califf, really looking at this um, with the FDA, the National Academy of Sciences, and a few of us who sort of are interested in this area. Um, that hasn't gone on hold. So that's continued despite um, a change of commissioner. The new commissioner I know is interested in this. I think we're going to see the FDA pulling on this much more than they've done in the past and recognising that this is an important source of evidence. Now, if I've got a worry, it's that the whole system sort of flips to saying real-world evidence is somehow the only way you can answer a question. It's the only way you can answer a certain type of question. So you've got to know what question it is you're going after to know what to use. But I think the FDA are investing pretty heavily in how to do this. Uh, and I suspect the same will be true in, in, in Europe in, in due course as well. But um, uh, you know, from a parochial UK point of view, um, I'm excited about what has been possible to do in the UK, and I'm also extremely aware of what's going to happen in the US and how quickly they're going to do it. And, uh, and therefore, there's something that, as part of what, what we do now, we need to be on top of this.